think that it's not a Catholic issue so much as it's a Christian issue that, that in the, the course of talking about marriage equality, one of the things that's happened, and a lot of it, frankly, has been in the Protestant world, has been the response uh, to people who want to expand marriage equality of saying that if you believe that, you're not a Christian. That is the denial of the fact that there were multiple viewpoints um, about what it meant to have gay and lesbian couples in our midst, uh, how we were to deal with those people. Um, the idea of multiple viewpoints within a Christian worldview uh, is something that's very troubling to people, that that was the bright line that they were using to define Christianity. Uh, you know, within Catholicism, it's a different question, because there you have church doctrine. The church has a hierarchy. It can define it that way in a, in a way that has legitimacy um, that doesn't extend to the Protestant world. So when we have, uh, you know, for example, I wrote a piece about uh, the Christian case for gay marriage. And I received hundreds and hundreds of responses. And so many of them said that you're not a Christian, uh, which was fascinating to me because how did it become that what defines us as people of faith is what we won't tolerate? Um, it seems like what should be more important is who we are. Uh, as opposed to how we judge other people. Um, you know, as, as followers of Christ, it seems that's the key question, uh, is who are we? Uh, how do we love God? How do we love our neighbor? As opposed to how do we judge others? Um, that's God's role. I noticed that the Catholic Church spent um, three quarters of a million dollars approximately on trying to prevent gay marriage. and. Then they were opposed by the Jewish community, the Lutheran community, a few others, and I think they spent hundreds of dollars. And when you always measure a strategy by how effective it was, the Catholic strategy failed. Well, the, the strategy failed, uh, the, the idea of restricting marriage equality failed across the country. I mean, it wasn't just here in Minnesota, but we had three other states that had votes at the same time um, on different things. We were the only one with a constitutional amendment in play. And there's really something significant about this point in time. And I, don't, I don't think it has to do necessarily with who's outspending who. Uh, what it goes to more than anything is that the, the first part of it that's undeniable is that there's a generational shift, that our, our children's generation, uh, this isn't really a debatable issue. Um, whereas with our, our parents' generation, uh, you know, it's, it's one where people have, in many communities, have a consensus on the other side. But they knew gay people, but there was an agreement between them that that person wasn't gay, they weren't going to say that they were, um, you weren't going to label them, and then they went about life that way. Yeah, and, and you know, what's fascinating is I taught at Baylor for 10 years, and Baylor is a Baptist school. It's one that uh, does not hire gay men and lesbians as professors or as staff. Uh, they have rules against uh, homosexuality uh, for the student body. Um, and there was some element of that, you know, that, that the historical fiction that you're talking about, we'll, we'll, we'll pretend people aren't gay, uh, even as they're in our midst. We know they're there, uh, and we've labeled it as wrong, but we will cover our eyes and our ears. Um, even, even in a place like that that's being challenged, the most famous Baylor student is Brittany Griner. And she just came out and said, I'm a lesbian. I've always been a lesbian. Hmm. Um, and to have that school defined simultaneously by faith and by a strong, admirable athlete who also is gay is going to force it to confront that juxtaposition. What are the things that, let's go back 20 or 30 years, where suddenly we understand that there's gay people around us. They're mm -hmm. on TV. There's Billy Crystal as a gay character on TV. Ellen so DeGeneres is yeah. a major player, too, where we maybe don't understand why we have to hate her. She seems like such a nice person. She might be the most subversive person to bring gay and lesbian ideas to this nation. Yeah, and what's really interesting is to contrast people like that with what came before, with Paul Lynn. Uh, you know, people, a hidden person. Right, people who remember Paul Lynn, you know, from Hollywood Squares or other things. Right, these, these people who, uh, 
at some level embraced being gay, but kind of as self-caricature. And that, that was a dangerous thing um, in a lot of ways. And then I th what happened over time is that instead of a Paul Lind or a Liberace, you do have an Ellen DeGeneres. You do have these uh, humans, <laughs> uh, fully formed, who are not caricatures, who are presented to us. And maybe that allowed us to see the people around us who were always there, who were gay. I think for the people who haven't come out, there's tremendous psychological pressure on them. <clears throat> I've had two male gay friends that I believe committed suicide because their parents in small towns wouldn't accept them. And um, I think it's pretty hard to not be out. Yeah. Well, in, in 2010, I wrote a piece uh, for the Huffington Post called Repentance of an Anti-Gay Bigot. And it reflected on the fact that when I was a kid, I was a hockey player, that what we did was bullying gay kids. You know, that, that the things we said and the things we did were bullying. There's tremendous, let's go into yeah. that really deeply, I think, because that's the, to the issue right now at the state capitol, the anti-bullying bill. In fact, children have such a, an affinity for trying to single out someone who's different, and I think it's because they're insecure themselves and they want to say, I'm better than X, that person X. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's a human instinct that we, we want to label the other and then elevate ourselves morally above the other. That's one of the things about, about that being done by people of faith that's especially discouraging, is that time and again, when Christ was on the earth, his message was judge thyself. Uh, it was one of humility, of personal humility, not of elevating yourself over others by judging them, but rather taking acceptance for our own faults. Um, and that was, that was the key moment for me, was as a Christian, was seeing that my action, what I had to look at, wasn't being gay, it was being so uh, harmful. Was this an emotional day. transformation for you very. or a logical one? No, it's a very emotional one. Because you had a person that you knew? Um, no, you know what happened is that I uh, was killing time on the internet and stumbled on the It Gets Better videos. Yeah, which a guy named Dan Savage put together, um, you know, which were for, for gay kids in small towns largely saying, it gets better, you can get out, It'll when you get older, you'll find a community that won't make you feel the way that you feel now. And one of the videos, and actually the first video I found, was a, by a guy named Randy Roberts Potts. And Randy uh, is Oral Roberts' grandson. Grew up on the, the Oral Roberts compound in Tulsa. Um, and is gay. <laughs> and it was a remarkable video. And I, I was really struck by it. Um, and it made me reflect on that, that particular streak, the religious streak of uh, not just homophobia, but hostility to individual um, gay men and lesbians. Do you see this as almost a distinction between when we look out the window, we see maybe Old Testament and New Testament Christians that are picking from one book or the other to judge. Because Jesus says, um, love thy enemy, thy neighbor. But that's not the Old Testament. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jesus came to, to bring a new covenant. And one thing that is, uh, is fascinating and, and seems pretty clear to me is that when you read the New Testament, there's this, this great moment where Jesus lays it out uh, that principles are part of that new covenant as opposed to simply rules. That the, the uh, Pharisees come to him and say, all right, the Mosaic Law, 600 and some rules. And they were rules, you know, don't eat pork and things like that. Uh, which of these 600 is most important? Now that's a tough question. That's like, which of your kids do you love the most? Right, if you're, if you're a rabbi, if you're a, a teacher of Jewish law, which, which Jesus was, that's, that's an impossible question. And it is, asking, it is almost like asking which of your children do you love the most. And, and what's shocking is that Jesus doesn't do what every parent does. He doesn't say, oh, I love them all the same. They're all equally important. We must follow them all. Uh, he, he picks. He picks two, the two great commandments. And says, these are the most important. Love the, God, your, the Lord your God above all others. And love your neighbor as yourself. And those are principles. And that's the thing that's crucial, is that there is this shift um, at that point from rules to principles. And principles are difficult 
Because with principles, we have to figure some things out ourselves. We have to apply that principle to our own lives and judge it. And when I take those two great commandments, in that moment in 2010, I applied them to my own life, I realized I'm failing. I have failed pretty badly in terms of loving my neighbor as myself. Because if my neighbor is gay, I wasn't being loving. I was, I was, I was really doing dangerous things. And one of those things was working at Baylor, where my students had to go back in the closet. These were law students who had been openly gay in relationships very often. But to come to law school there, they had to leave their partners. They had to hide their sexuality. Um, and eventually I heard those stories. My students got a hold of me and said, here's what it meant to me that I lived in that environment when I was your student. And it was heartbreaking. I mean, to someone who's a teacher, that's the worst possible thing, is to have hurt your students. And that's part of what I did. And I, there was not much you can do that's more unchristian than that. Well, I think you've started to atone for it these last few years because you've yeah. gone out and you've had an agenda which was to sort of spread a new meme. Mm -hmm. And I might ask this because after listening to you so far, it doesn't sound like I'm talking to a professor of law. It sounds like I'm talking to a professor of theology. Well, I, uh, I, you know, I have no training in theology. Well, but uh -huh. you've integrated them quite a bit. These are yeah. not two different lives in your world. In your no, head. no, they're, not at all. They're one and the same. There's a reason that I teach at St. Thomas and not at the University of Minnesota. And it's because, uh, yes, there is uh, the, the faith that guides me. I can't keep secret. <laughs> it's a community here. Yeah. And, um, and it declared a community where you were all supposed to care for each other. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I'll tell you one thing, too, is that, that um, it's a community that, in that caring, we often challenge one another. That, you know, right now, we are sitting in, in my office. These are my books. Um, you know, on the other side of that wall is the office of somebody who is completely on the other side of me from this issue. But I can tell you this, that, that if I'm trying to work something through and she's walking by outside my door, I'll call her in and ask if she has time to talk and say, here's what I'm thinking about writing. Here's, you know, here's, uh, here's what I'm thinking might happen next. Isn't there no better way to learn or challenge yourself than go and face the ideas that are opposed to yourself? Same yep. with people who are in the same mindset. Group think with you. Yeah. Um, you go off and don't know another world. Yeah, and you know, sometimes they're right <laughs> as well. I mean, I, for example, sometimes they're right because I haven't thought about something, and that's coming to this issue in the first part place. It was because I hadn't thought about it. Uh, and sometimes they're right because they're presenting something that you haven't thought about yet uh, very thoroughly.